Um, and I'm, I think Star Wars had a big impact on me. Interesting. Mm-hmm. I haven't said this publicly, so I'm giving you some scoops here, Fish. I want you to have some good stuff. I think Star Wars, when I was like 30, 25, I was able to rewind and say, fuck, no wonder I was so attracted to Star Wars. It's the story of life. It is that there's good and there's evil, and they're kind of actually close in energy, but good by the tip of its nose will outpace bad. Mm. You know, because the fucking, the dark side's rough. The emperor is a beast. It's not like Yoda can beat the emperor so easily. And and I think that that's the impact. And so when I saw that, bless you, Dustin, when I able, when I, at 30 or 35, when things about good and evil and positive and negative, all these psychological things became interesting to me, I was able to rewind why I was so attracted to those characters and stories and what did Han Solo or Chewbacca or Yoda or the Emperor or Greedo even, who made a quick appearance, mean to me? That is my ambition for V Friends. I want a 50 year old in, in 70 years to be like, oh crap, no wonder I'm so accountable. Accountable Ant was my favorite character as a kid mm. and I learned quickly that accountability was the quickest path to happiness and blaming and pointing fingers was the reverse and I believe today, for example, a shocking amount of humans in America and around the world, but in America, there's a direct correlation to their unhappiness on their ability to blame everyone, the president, governments, bosses, their parents, and their capacity of blame is what's leading to their unhappiness. And that comes from? Culture, right? It comes from politicians, it comes from television, it comes from social media, it comes from mainstream media, it comes from what is popular in culture. When I started first talking about hustle in 2008 because the economy was bad, I was revered for making people happy that they were in control and if they grinded it, they could win. Eight years later, when the world was fluffy and overflown with cash, I was demonized because people converted that term into slang of burnout. Mm. Now I can use hustle again instead of hard work because we're now getting, I mean, I, like a year ago, I'm like, wait a minute, people are saying this in a good way again. There's always a temperament, right? You know, pilots were the most famous people in America in 1960. Nobody even thinks, tw- nobody even knows one pilot by name in America today. Yeah, pilots and astronauts. That's right. That's, I think I heard that. That's um, right. Those yeah, I yeah. mean, uh, major athletes, I'm talking in the Hall of Fame of baseball and football, had summer jobs because they didn't get paid enough being professional athletes and they would work in a hardware store in the Bronx. This is real. Yeah. New York Yankees in the 50s worked in Hoboken at a hardware retail store during the off season because it didn't pay enough. <laughs> like, things change. And so, to answer your question, What's, what's happened now is we've created entitlement because we're an empire in first world countries around the world and we haven't had a world war in a long time and we're worrying about churchary things, not primary things. We're not worried about roof over our heads. We're worried that we don't have a Mercedes. And when we don't have a Mercedes, we blame someone that we don't, because we don't wanna, we're really bad at being accountable. I'm just empathetic that the temperament of our society was demonizing energy as something negative and I just decided to take, that was a thoughtful, not even a subconscious, that was a thoughtful decision that, oh, people are not hearing me. That's on me, back to accountability. Mm. When people are like, Gary, you just care about money. I'm like, okay, (laughs) I'm not doing a good job. If someone believes that, I'm not doing a good job. So I consciously have, you know, changed up energy in certain scenarios to make sure my point is not being lost because I'm trying to bring value and if you dismiss me because you think I'm a Jersey, you know, street kid and you're a academic Mm. and you dismiss me, well then I can't achieve the good that I want to give you. I'm not hurt by it. I'm not disrespected. I'm not miffed. I'm not insecure about it. I just have a mission and I'm enjoying my mission and why do I, why would I have the audacity to say, oh fuck you, you don't get me? And no, it's the reverse. I have the humility, like a hedgehog, to say, wait a minute, I need to mix this up. And then also, the things that I talk about change as I become more educated of what the issue is. I didn't realize 10 years ago how much insecurity was stopping people from doing the things I was telling them were so easy to do to grow their thing. Because you grew up in such an environment. Where that wasn't my issue, correct. I'm like, it never dawned on me in 2006 that the reason somebody would not start a YouTube channel was because they were worried about somebody saying they're ugly. 
But by 2015 and 20, with my popularity and getting all my DMs, I started reading the temperature of the world and I'm like, oh, these people buy these jewelry not because they just want the jewelry because that makes them look successful and they're trying to prove to everyone they're successful because they grew up not feeling successful. I just got done interviewing uh, Robin Hood, yes. the artist, yes. our buddy. Yeah. And you know he grew up with a t- dad that was really tough on yeah. him and called him fat fuck and, yeah. like, and like was really mean. And, yeah. But that's also driven him to go to the gym now. Of course. But he still just told me just like an hour ago of like, like that still sits with him. That of insi- that, ins- that insecurity. That's right. That's right. So the people that don't grow up with moms like you, yes. Do, do you have any advice on how to get there? Get, get, yeah. Get there. Get there. A ton. Get there a little faster. Well, no, nope, that word scares me. <laughs> the faster part is why I think people don't get there. You know, I have a father who grew up with a totally different mother, and I was very affected by that father. So I've been thinking about this shit my whole life. I'm not, by the way, just so everybody understands when they when I talk about my mom, I hope everybody understands. I didn't grow up in a fairy land. I have a lot of things. I had a very different dad who had, you know, who I have a great relationship with, but there was, a, there was 25 years of work to get to where we are today. Uh, and that's me being a grown up at 22 to today. I grew up being the oldest child of an immigrant family. I was told from day one, you take care of everything. Do you know how many things That's I not fucked fair up? To in? A kid. Of course. Do you know how many things I fucked up in my life because I'm always taking care of everything? Mm. So I have no angst towards my parents. It's a big you know this. My big theme at VCon this year was fuck your grandparents. Yeah. Right? Which is not fuck your grandparents. <laughs> right. I love people's grandparents. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying if you're gonna be mad at your mom or your dad, well, don't you know that they had a mom and dad that made them the way they are? Yeah. I mean, so if you're gonna be like, my parents fucked me up, so fuck my parents, well no 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 no. You need to be mad at your grandparents because they fucked up your parents and shouldn't go there. And by the way, I don't know if you've heard, there's something called great grandparents. Yeah. And like, so. It goes all the way back to Adam and Eve who believe in the Bible, so, right? Like, you know, so these are things I think about constantly. And of course, there's gifts and curses that came along with being a human. I just think we're spending way too much time right now on the curses. I think we need to be more grateful and optimistic. Do you think everyone has intuition? I think everyone has intuition. I don't think people. I think there's levels to it. I think everybody can play basketball. Like, I don't know, like all four of us in the room right now could go outside right now and play basketball. Yeah. My intuition on that is we will not look like the New York Knicks that play at Madison Square Garden, no matter how bad of a basketball team they are. They are dramatically better than the four of us. I think a lot of people have been told not to believe in intuition, which means they haven't practiced intuition. I think a lot of people are scared to get hurt so they don't go under intuition because when they have in the past, somebody hurt them and they're scared to get hurt again. Um, I think there's a lot that goes into intuition, but for me, intuition is everything. Now, you were blessed with like that, that mother again, so like your intuition probably off to a little bit faster of a start, well, I think, I think a there's start. A, I think there's a direct correlation to intuition and self-esteem. Okay. So I think it takes risk to follow your intuition. And I think if you're not scared that somebody can hurt you because you have your own self-esteem, you'll practice intuition more. I don't, I don't think it's a requirement. I don't think it's a, I don't think everyone needs to have a personal brand. I think everyone should consider it. It's not for everyone. There's a lot of baggage that comes with being a public figure. Now most people won't have the level of public figureness that I have. So I think for a lot of people, especially in a B2B environment, I think it's epic because there's nobody here who's the next fucking Taylor Swift or Charlie D'Amelio. Like it's not that kind of industry for that. So I think, but what it will be is it leads to you being on, it leads to this conference inviting you to be on stage next year. Like there's a lot of value in it in B2B. B2C is a little scarier because it can change your life. If you became internet famous, your life's different. And there's a lot of baggage that comes along with that. And a lot of people don't even, I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm not very interested in, how many people here really follow me? Like just for context? So all of you know, I don't share my personal life. I'm, I'm deeply private, deeply private. I just am so aware of the business ramifications of it. But why, why did I say that? You're in control. You don't, want, you don't want people in your business? Don't post it. I think to remind people, first, it's not for everyone, and that's okay, you don't have to. But I do think a lot of people think of it as only like high energy, dynamic person, it's not. There's a lot of very introverted, very thoughtful, very articulate, very deep thinking writers that crush, especially for this industry. You go write a white paper that really is right about what's happening and like talks about your solution and why it will work, 
you will be stunned how much that will work. So you gotta find your way of communicating. I, I think it's worth considering, but it's not a requirement. There are plenty of people who have monster businesses that has no personal brand attached to it. It also could lead to happiness. Let me explain. So now you're getting going a little bit with what we're talking about here, but you start, you remember like, wait a minute, he did mention that I could post other stuff and you post your first ever video cooking, ever. You love to cook, it's your place, it's where you feel like you're most you, you're even a little funnier, a little more dynamic, right? And you just film cooking a meal and you're talking and you just post it and it fucking explodes and you find yourself two years from now being literally a food influencer and making more money with brands supporting your food videos than you were doing being a senior executive. I believe it is a path to happiness. I just, I genuinely believe a lot of people here have deeper passions than what you're doing right now for your living. And I think it's worth potentially scratching those itches. So hacking attention, or the way I think about it, day trading, is a very simple and complicated game. Where are you all spending your time? Where? Like, where are your eyeballs and ears going? It, you know, 50 years ago was television and newspapers. And so you, you would try to then make the best print ad to make you buy. I did that in my career. I used to spend a week making my New York Times full page ad, a week. I would be eight hours a day, a week. Should I put this wine in this corner? Should I have a coupon down here? Like real thinking. Now that same thinking goes into the first three seconds of every video I put on LinkedIn. It goes into the thumbnail. Some of my friends here are doing a really good job on LinkedIn. We were hanging out backstage and I said to him, hey, you gotta pay attention to the copy because LinkedIn, only the first 50 letters show up and then you have to hit, you know, learn more. Most people won't do that. If you have a call to action link in the first 50, then you're gonna get a higher retention, right? Or, you know, or, how do you actually think about what's happening? You're all doing it, all of you minimally. I'm, I'm aware that some of you don't have anything, not LinkedIn, not Facebook, but the far majority of this room is doing this on something. TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube Shorts. How do you get someone to stop? Especially with more content coming. So what I think a lot about is the science around the art. First three seconds, thumbnail, words. What time do we post? Literally, right now, I'll show him and you can confirm it to you. My team, this is the thread with the whole team on it. Look at the, look at this. We will post this today at 6.36 p.m. It is that specific. Like, you know, and like, like, read the what, whole, read. What, ideal times today, 4.04 and 6.36, one reel, one image. For, re, for the reel, recommendation is a reel of you on stage. I promise you this is a level of commitment that's very different than, post that picture. <laughs> so, the science around the art but then also following trends. Like when Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift are eating up popular culture, is there any way for you to interject into that conversation that doesn't feel forced? How clever are you? How creative are you? You know, it, you know like uh, I saw a really good post by a B2B company where the two heads of the company well, uh, one was called, one, one person's name was Travis and one was Taylor. They were both dudes, but it was perfect, right? Because, you know, like, they were able to, like, make a reference and I looked back, it was their highest performing post ever, right? So, I'm, I'm looking at the pulse of society. You know how many people lost customers by posting during inappropriate times? So you have to have a feel for the room, which is the world. You have to know your demos. I'm making content on LinkedIn for just VCs and the next post just to get clients and the next post just to get talent to apply to VaynerMedia. All three of those videos are very different. I was telling those guys, everything they make is just about selling the SaaS, but they should make videos to get better talent on their sales team. They should make better, they should make videos about how they run company culture. They should make, by the way, a thing that all of you should do on LinkedIn is make a post about your interests. Maybe it's French wine, maybe it's golf, maybe you're playing pickleball. You might post on LinkedIn that you have fallen in love with pickleball, go into the fact that that hour now, every day that you play pickleball in the morning, makes you fresher to be better at work. And because someone who you're trying to reach as a customer or an employee also likes pickleball, that just created consideration based on relevance for them to do business with you. So everyone's showing up in LinkedIn in their fucking suit and tie, right? But, but in reality, in reality, you need to show that version and this version. Definitely. 
that you're in, you know, notice, I always say watch what I'm doing, not what I'm saying, like, or, you know, like, like, pay attention to how I give a keynote. Like, I will make references to the New York Jets. I will make references to wine. I'm creating connection points. And all of you should be doing that in your content. If you're just saying the same thing of like, our tech works better, like, cool, but like, like you can only say it so many times. AI companies should be talking about time savings. You put a photo of a person watching their child play basketball in a gym, and then you say, use our tech and save an hour every day so you can go watch your kid play basketball, watch how many people stop. That's a very different emotional connection point. Because inevitably somebody on the other side of that LinkedIn post is sitting in the office right now missing a recital or a game and feels hot. We all are modern parents. We feel like shit. Our parents didn't give a fuck. We, you know, we're, we feel like shit. We feel like shit and all of a sudden that hits you and say, wait a minute, maybe that's why I should pay up for the tech because I do want that hour back because I do want to eat dinner with my family once a week and like that's real shit. Just the real way humans work and so my efficiency on that post will go up. This is like real shit. Like I think, I, it's why I laugh how people think about social media. People look at social media like it's bad, it's ruining the world, or my kid's all fucked up, or it, like, it is disproportionately the most significant engine of business growth on earth. And there isn't a close second. See, I wrote a book in 2009 called Crush It, which really talked about what I thought was gonna happen and ended up happening with social media and all this. It went very viral. I was pretty unknown, I was in the wine world, but definitely not in the business world. And I started getting asked to speak. And I don't know if you picked up on this, but I curse. Um, and I'm very casual. And today, what I, the way I'm dressed on stage, even in an event like this, you can kind of somewhat get away with it. The casualization of business over the last 15 years has happened. In 2009, it wasn't there yet. And CAA was my speaking bureau at the time. And they called me, because I, I was naturally good at it. I didn't know that I was a good public speaker. And I'm, you can see how I speak, it's very improv. It's very like, it's not a presentation. Even for the people that follow me the most, they, they'll see things that I say often, but there's always new shit. It's contextual. My speaking bureau reached out to me like pretty aggressively in like a good way. They came from a good place. They're like, bro, you could be like a legitimate speaker. Like you could be big. Like this could work for you. And it's very lucrative. But you have to start wearing a suit and you can't curse. And they didn't even finish the sentence and I said to them, you just, I'm like, thank you. Because they were coming from a good place. I'm like, you just don't know me. I'm not capable of that. I'm just really great at one thing, which is being comfortable in my own skin and dealing with the ramifications of that. Pro and con. That is my greatest skill set. So all of that is just really how I live my life. And I'm okay that People won't book me to speak because they don't want someone to curse or they think it's disrespectful to be too casual. I, I respect that, that's their house. That's their event, they're allowed. But I'm not interested in feeling uncomfortable because I can't be my best self. When I'm speaking, I want to impact people. Like, I, I, all of you just saw that talk. I was like reinforcing over and over the same thing because I know the three little, there's like three or four things for that collective group, knowing there was a lot of different people in there, those were the three things that if they did, better shit would happen. And like, if I'm not comfortable, I'm not gonna be able to authentically like hit. Do you know what I mean? And I'm aware that there's people in there that thought it was inappropriate that I cursed. I believe that every time. Like, I'm, I believe that and I respect that. But, but I also know on the flip side, that talk has much more impact on the collective than most talks that would be given. And that's all you could ask for, right? have as big of an impact so no I don't I don't I'm not like Vince McMahon and like creating a character that I think will work I just got very fortunate that the world went in my direction I'm, I always think about myself of like who the hell would have I been if I was doing business in the 60s 70s and 80s it would have been tough because I wouldn't have gone there and it just I would have been some sort of different thing I mean it might have been better I might have been very unique and a trailblazer but um, no, I'm, I'm just not comfortable of doing anything that doesn't come naturally to me. I just always feel like it's icky and off. And me like not in my pure form is like bad. There may not be a more cliche stereotype than the fitness dude who built a fitness business on social and then decided to teach everybody how to build business and build a personal brand, you're like in my pocket. 
The answer to the question is, you need to post 30 times a day on social media. But you have to be good at it. So what you need to do is what I just said about AI. You need to start Googling and YouTubing and podcasting and educate yourself on something I call SOC. Strategic organic content. Not just posting happy fucking Wednesday and hoping it works. Like why are you posting? Let me just pull it up right now. Watch this, you like this. I'm going into my phone, I'm going into my content team WhatsApp and apologize, I need to run to a meeting so I'm gonna run out pretty quickly here so I apologize. I'm gonna scroll up, here it is. Here we go. This morning at 7.21 a.m. Mackenzie on my team said, good morning, I need you to post at 5.04 p.m. and 7.07 p.m. on Instagram. One needs to be a carousel, one needs to be a reel. This is called the science behind the art. I'm not out here posting randomly for ha ha ha. My social media strategy is not the following. (gasps) (laughs) All of yours is. I need you to understand the thumbnail, the first three seconds, what time you post, how many words, which platform, What's going on on LinkedIn carousels? That's different than Facebook carousels, Facebook reels. What are broadcast channels? Do you know what the fuck is going on? This is now the television. And until you understand that, you are leaving money on the table. Back to scaring them. This is how it works, brother. Right now, everyone, most likely, is just leaving double growth on the table. And then it becomes the thing that puts them out of business. And so, Please take this serious, what you need to do. How many times a day do you post? I know it's nothing, how many? Five months, five months, we'll post a day. And some days not even, right? Yeah, some days not even. Right. We'll better about one a day, flood the story and stuff. Right, think about where I am in my career and where I wanna go and where you are, you wanna grow, you're, you're day one. Yeah. I shouldn't be the one in this relationship posting 55 times a day. You understand? My friends, the number one issue in the world politics, religion, uh, business, is everyone's in the business of convincing. Everyone's spending all their time trying to convince everyone else to see it the way they see it, whatever it is. So to your point, you're trying to convince these franchisees to do the right thing, to grow their business. The problem is, it is very hard to convince. So in our organization, and everything I do for a living as a businessman, I say, Don't convince, have conviction. So instead of spending even one minute trying to convince someone that you already know the second you start talking to them, you know, you're like, fuck, this isn't happening. Spend all your time on you marketing, what you control, to create the case studies for them. I've I've innovated my whole career. When I sell new stuff, I do that all the time. I don't even spend a sem- another minute with 98% of the people I talk to or market to because I know there is no convincing. I just look for the 2% that understand what the hell I'm talking about, build, and then let the cake. Everybody made fun of me about the internet until they did it. Everybody made fun of me for doing a wine show on YouTube in 2006 here in Jersey until they did it. Everybody made fun of me for taking my life savings and investing in a company called the Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr until they did it. They laugh at you and then your competitors cry. And so I think you have to be in the conviction business. I don't think you will convince them. I think you have to do good marketing, show them the ROAS, the ROI, the CAC, the LTV of the marketing you do, and then just keep feeding them the information of like, you're leaving money on the table and the case studies will always do the work better than you just talking it. So I love when people are like, Gary, Like inevitably one of you may email me or send me a message after this talk and be like, hey, heard you, but like I did TikTok for six months and it didn't work. And I'm like, cool, I played football in my backyard. It didn't work out the same way it did for OJ. (laughs) Like the ROI of a basketball for LeBron James is gonna end up being billions of dollars. For me, like negative 20,000, I have two torn meniscuses. So to your point, you figured out organic TikTok and you were good at it. To your credit, TikTok ads are not as strong converters as Instagram and Facebook because Meta's been around for 15 years and has refined it. Do I believe that TikTok ads 
work, yes. Do I believe that's reserved currently for the best 1% of operators on it? Yes. Even us who are the crew, like it ebbs and flows as we refine our capability on it and the platform does. Instagram ads work remarkable because Meta's data on their consumer is bananas. TikTok's algorithm is addicting because it gives you what you want to look at, but it doesn't understand you as well. It understands what you like, but Facebook like really knows what you bought, like got it? So like you could like some, you could love the Jets or the Giants, but you might not be someone who buys football jerseys. Whereas someone else might like it half as much, but buys 10 a year. Facebook's better at understanding that than TikTok, hence why converting is different, right? But that ebbs and flows and TikTok will get there. Um, As far as the next one, the reason I have a good reputation is I don't guess. When I told you at that event in 2019 that TikTok was next, is because it was TikTok was already it. I'm good at knowing what is it when the world hasn't figured it out yet. I'm just a little faster, it's like sports. People would not, people that don't really understand sports, even like a good fan doesn't understand, just a little more speed can change everything. That's why they run in Indianapolis at the Combine. Those point two might actually matter, especially when it's later in the game or this, that, and the other thing. So, same with what I do for a living. I don't need to predict anything. I'm just spending every day watching everything. And when it's time, when I know it crossed over, it's not a fad, it's not Be Real or Peach, or you know, Vine was on its way. Vine was the app that really was the precursor to everything we're seeing now, but it got bought by Twitter, so it never got to go, like I'm watching everything, but the second I know I get, I'm, I'm very intellectually generous. The second I know it's there, I tell the world, because nobody's gonna, it's not like some weird secret that you're gonna take from me. There's so much for all of us. Even today, the people that are sitting here, which is, I know the majority that have not gone all in on content on social networks, They may be sitting here feeling like it's too late. What's cool about social media marketing is it's a game of better, not a game of first. I need a lot of you to hear that. Because I feel a lot of you are not jumping in here because like, fuck, I missed that trade. It's a game of better. It's a game of better. I just want to make this point because I think a lot of people in this room might be struggling with this. I I genuinely do not believe Gen Z is lazy. I, I, I really don't. I think that a lot of us are spending too much time demonizing the up and coming generation about being lazy and entitled. I just need you to hear this for me. Of course, look, I know unlimited people that are lazy in the boomer and Gen X and millennial set too, and entitled. It's not that they're lazy and entitled, it's that they have options. They don't want to work for you for $18 an hour doing dumb shit when they can just post silly videos on TikTok and make $38 an hour. So I'm saying this because I wanna leave here with y'all winning after I leave. Some of you might be, I need to actually be nicer to my employees, real talk. Some of you it might be, yeah, it's 2024 and everything that's happening in the world is based on social media content. It might be a good idea for me to finally take this serious for my business. For some of you, it might be you stop complaining about these kids don't wanna work and realize why. It's because they have options. The average 18 year old kid knows that they can make $50,000 a year on the internet for them pretty easily. And so we have to understand that, we have to adjust. And once you understand that truth and don't just spend your time dwelling or shooting the shit with your other person that's mad about it and you start attacking of what you're gonna do about it to grow your business, you become accountable to truth instead of trading on ideology. If you were starting now, what would you do on TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, or Facebook? Yeah, so I think, again, back to the earlier point of self-awareness, if you're selling B2B, all of a sudden LinkedIn is number one, right? If you're selling, if you're a SaaS, if you started a SaaS business, if you're listening right now and you want to sell, or you you sell to lawyers, you have a service that sells to lawyers, Mm -hmm. then LinkedIn's gonna be number one globally for sure with YouTube Shorts probably being number two because YouTube is a search engine yes. and a lot of people search there so that would also be good if you were into SaaS. And then probably in that scenario, I would then say if you're selling you know, a B2B service, after those two 
probably Facebook grounded in a Facebook group with then Twitter X being probably fourth. If you're selling SaaS, Instagram's probably a distant fifth. Right. Snapchat, Pinterest, they're super far away in that scenario. If you're selling t-shirts to 15 to 25 year olds, all of a sudden TikTok becomes number one, Instagram probably becomes number two in that scenario, and YouTube Shorts is number three. Right. So I think for a lot of people, that's that reality. For broader markets, I think that if you're really trying to sell something, like to the broad consumer, call it for everybody who's 25 to 55, well, now you start getting into Facebook still being an incredibly powerful platform for selling. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that organic TikTok for branding is exciting. Instagram, again, becomes a stronger selling platform, but both of those scenarios require ads more than organic reach. Yeah. Um, whereas TikTok, you can win on organic reach and kind of capture lightning in a bottle. So, the you know, I hope everybody appreciates the answer. It 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 is contextual, but I think as far as the answer to what you would do inside of it, obviously there's a lot of science and math of what time do you post, how long is the copy. I think a couple things to look out for. Number one, the best YouTubers in the world, starting with Mr. Beast down spend more time and more money on their thumbnail than you could ever imagine. So number one, for everybody who's gonna do video, and again, that's a whole nother conversation because for some people it should be written word, so some people should be doing audio, some people should be doing video. But I think, uh, I think the thumbnail on video is incredibly important. I think the first three seconds thing that Dustin and I were talking about on our trip this week is, do we need the hook from the, from the thumbnail to be delivered on in the first two or three or four seconds. And, and we, we really believe we do. We believe that if, if my hook says, you know, 30 to 40 year olds, you should be thinking about LinkedIn. And if my opening line is like, before we get into that, I, you know, like you might, in two seconds, you may lose that audience. I think a couple of other things. There's a lot of ways to do it. Let me encourage some people. One thing that I've been noticing is on Instagram, you could just take a photo of something, right? You were here with your friend this weekend in New York. You could take a photo of like a nice picture that caught your eye in New York. Take a photo. But if you then wrote three paragraphs, really great ones, because you're a great writer, about the concept of enjoying the weekends to reset, of the concept of busyness and chaos in controlled chaos is an effective way to be an entrepreneur. You could write, the, you know, curiosity. I've been to New York seven times, but I've never gone down this street. Like, you could take a photo of anything, a banana, a car, a tree, a bird, your backyard. It, you really could take a photo of almost anything and then write three or four paragraphs that are very thoughtful about a point you're trying to make. Now, all of a sudden, you don't need a video and editing team. You could do it all by yourself. And for a lot of people listening, they're not great on camera, they're not great with their words, but they're incredible writers. And so it's around self-awareness of the, me the, the style, the content, and then there's strategy around the distribution depending on your business. And so that's one main theme. To keep getting very nerdy and deep on your question, the other thing to always look for is underpriced attention. Yeah. The thing that I know you know about me over these last seven, eight years is that I have a very strong skill set in understanding where there's more organic reach against consumption and, and when to do it hard than most people and that's been a big part of my success. You were there when I was yelling about Musical.ly and TikTok when that, when that seemed crazy to almost everyone. You, you weren't there but people that have been following me all the way back to 2005, six and seven there was an, an incredible amount of content and passion I had around YouTube and Twitter and Facebook. I mean, I wrote Crush It in 2008. Yeah. Came out in 09, but I wrote it in 2008. That's 15 years ago. Long time. <laughs> so I, I think that I constantly look for the underpriced attention. It's always most exciting when it comes up in a new platform, but new platforms only come around every three, four, seven, nine years. Yeah. Then when it's not a platform, it goes into the things we just talked about. Mm -hmm. The strategy 
within the platforms. I talked about recently, and it's already lost momentum in a month, but a month ago, I was incredibly excited about posting a meme and then a video on Instagram, a two post carousel. I saw that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know, I, I, I see incredible uh, opportunity in that. Again, almost talking to Dustin, I'm almost having my own meeting right now. One thing that continues to work for me is taking headlines that are happening in pop culture business and doing a green screen and talking over it. That model continues to work better than if I just looked in camera right now and talked and about it. And even when the, the, green skin, the, the green screen video is not great quality, mm -hmm. like it doesn't look good, but it, it works. Correct, to your point, my last one, which did really well, I was in the car and the light was hitting a different way and it wasn't like my, yeah, I was like distorted, right. that's right. <laughs> But I think, I think that that's, um, I think a great strength of mine that I would encourage people to consider is constantly trying new formats. Mm. You know, uh, I'll use you as an example. We've talked in the past, whether on DM or Twitter or in a VFriends Discord or like this, about like, mm, I, I'd like to get more traction. I want more views on my videos. And something that I don't think I've given good advice on in the past to you or the hundreds of thousands of people that have asked me is, look, if you have the same exact format, format, not you're talking about different things, but mm -hmm. it's camera to face yeah. and you post it as an Instagram reel and you're doing that 50, 100 times and you're not getting really the results you want after 100 times, you've gotta change it. Mm -hmm. You've gotta change your format. Maybe you bring on a guest. Maybe you go to green screen. Maybe you go to written word and picture. I think, you know, I always think about that concept of like, you know, the definition of insanity is like doing the same thing over and over and, and thinking you'll have a different outcome. So I do think, I want to give permission to a lot of people out there like, if you've done a hundred, I think that's the right thing, if you've done a hundred of the same format mm -hmm. per se and you're really, really getting nowhere and you're now six months in, you know, you should challenge yourself to try different formats. Look, I believe in 40 to 50 core things, yeah. and then I layer what's happening in the world at the time, yeah. and new and different formats and platforms. And I think um, there's something there, there. Mm -hmm. no, that's that's good advice. I'm gonna try that, because I love doing reels, like I love doing the video, and some work, some don't. And then something that works on Instagram, then I put it on TikTok, it doesn't work over there. Yeah, TikTok's a whole different it's so animal. Hard. It, it, yeah, it's hard. <laughs> it is hard. But I think, you know, I remind people like yourself, myself, I say this to myself all the time. If you're looking for something special to happen, it's supposed to be hard. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, I, I, I hear, you know, right? Like, even, right? Like, yeah, it's supposed to be hard. <laughs> yeah, like I was in this, uh, I was, where was I? Oh, I was Friday night. I was in um, in an airport lounge in Dallas, and this gentleman, like a 60 year old guy, which is, you know, he was a real yappy guy. I was trying to get a little work done before my flight to LA, but he wanted to talk and I'm about that. Like he had no clue who I was or anything like that nature. We were just talking. And he, um, he got into something and he was like, it's, it really seemed to me that this was a gentleman, and I confirmed some of this through the conversation, you know, really, really came from rural America, really like came from nothing, nothing, and made a life of himself. And you know, it was really nice and his son was getting married in Tennessee in a couple weeks, really enjoyed the conversation. But he kind of talked about, you know, uh, how hard he worked and then he was talking about what was hard for him now. And I kind of had this fun moment where I was like, hey brother, like you of all people know, like you didn't get to this point by accident. You don't have to do the next thing, but it's not gonna happen without hard work. And so I think, you know, yeah, I think people ask to be known, to get compensated for being themselves, to sell books, to speak, to sell things. It should be hard because 99% of the world works for someone else. Mm -hmm.